Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. In my last video, I broke down the Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition trailer shown at E3, along with the release screenshots. E3 just keeps on giving though, and we now have a look at some proper gameplay. It's a pretty short clip and interview, but shows a lot of new features and quality of life improvements we can expect in the game when it's released this fall. The interview is with Cision, one of the co-founders of the studio that's been designing all the new expansions and civilizations, as well as the creative director at Microsoft Studios. You may recognize him from the first Definitive Edition Q&A, or from his work back in the day on Command & Conquer. Before jumping into any gameplay though, here's a clip where we get a good sense of their philosophy and vision behind Definitive Edition. We, we try to focus a lot of what do the people actually want. Yeah. We actually ask the community, hey guys, what do you want from Age of Empires 2DE? And the one thing they always said like, don't touch the gameplay. Gameplay is great, <laughs> the game is so much fun, don't, don't touch it. Uh, so we tr what we really tried to do was like bring out the gameplay a bit more, like try to get rid of the annoying things, make like farm receding, make it a bit easier, uh, having a good idea of, of what's going on in your empire. You don't have to click through all the buildings anymore to see what's going on. Wow. Uh, and on top of that, we also added new content to the game. So we had uh, the original game back in 1999, came with 13 civilizations. And over the years, and, and Justin worked with us on yes. this, uh, we released new expansions. And now with yeah. DE, we even add another expansion back with four new civilizations and three campaigns. Now all of that sounds really good to me. The game stuck around for a reason, and I think we all assumed, but it's nice to hear confirmed that there will be both quality of life improvements, like automatic farm reseeding, as well as more content like civilizations. On top of all of the visual updates, it's basically including a whole new expansion worth of content for $15 if you already own the game. If you don't own the expansions or Age of Empires at all, it's an even better deal with a projected price of $20 to include all of the new stuff as well as the previous expansions. Adam then goes on to say the following. You know, all of the new artwork, all the new voice, everything that we've done for the campaigns, it's just been a crazy amount of content that we've updated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and that. That doesn't even talk about, you know, 4K graphics, completely orchestral soundtrack, right? Uh, modern multiplayer solutions, like all of this stuff that we've added to the game to really make the most definitive edition I think we could make possible. Uh. I'm intrigued here by the line about multiplayer solutions. Is this matchmaking, dedicated servers? What current problem is exactly being solved? It's not clear to me, but if Definitive Edition is going to unite the community and bring over the more serious players, it's going to need to match Vubly in performance. I really hope multiplayer is going to be their main focus during the open beta. In fact, speaking of the beta, if you're interested in that, you can sign up for it at ageofempires.com. Moving on, Adam also talks a bit about the role of the Age of Empires community. We've been working closely with the community for over a year now on all the Age of Empires games. Um, to make sure that everything that we put into the game, at its heart, like Bert said, is driven by the community. Okay, and then when you talk about the flighting program and specifically having the community, like what kind of experience can the community have when they're part of the flighting program? Like, you, like what do you tell? Like, how do they work with you? So oh to speak? well, I mean, you know, we have we have all the usual channels that they can get in touch with us. We have forums where we can get feedback. Uh, we have community councils that we're slowly going to grow over time, where we get uh, really high-end players in to be able to give us direct feedback. Um, we've learned a lot over the years of how we want to deal with, uh, and talk to the community, and it's, it's a two-way street. We don't want to be a developer, um, any of us that are working on age games, that just sits there and be like, okay, yeah, we'll listen to you. We don't want that at all. We want an interaction with everyone that's part of the Age of Empires community. He's definitely right that there are active forums out there. In fact, I've always had the impression that Forgotten Empires kept good tabs on the community, whether it's in public, like comments left on my videos, to personal messages I've received from members of the team, and interviews like the one I've gotten to do with Promi about the AI. I really do see a lot of what Adam's talking about here. After that, they jumped into a live demo, and we get a sense of what the game looks like in its current state. The clip is from the new Tamerlane campaign as the Tatars. Right away, we get a look at their new architecture and the new user interface, as well as the zoom function. To take a minute and break down the new user interface, we can see that like Definitive Edition 1, we have not just the resources displayed, but also the number of villagers on each resource. That's really nice for build orders and just keeping a general eye on your economy, and was something I was really hoping would be included. You also have a new location for the idle villager icon with the number of idle villagers displayed. Hopefully this helps avoid the constant checking of your idle villager hotkey now that you can easily see it at a glance, which again only adds to the game by taking out a bit of mindless micromanagement. In the top right it's pretty similar to what we had before, 
My bet is this is the tech tree and we also have the objectives, chat, diplomacy and options up there. It's all basically the same except it seems we also have one extra button, which I'm not sure what it does. In fact, I can't see it well enough to even speculate. If you're wondering why it's so blurry, it's just because it's a recording of a recording, scaled down and then back up. So don't think it's going to be this blurry, the game in 4K should be really clear on any monitor. Down in the bottom right we have the flare and stat buttons. This one looks quite similar to the current overlay button and probably lets you toggle between the military and economic overlays as opposed to having three separate buttons. I think that's a good way to make things feel less cluttered. This one down here where the idle villager button used to be is an outline like the other and I wonder if it tells you the type of map you're playing. Theoretically Arabia, Islands or Black Forest could all have a different icon. That seems like a useful feature to me though I am completely speculating. In another E3 demo clip we can see the stats also tell you what civilization each player is at a glance. And I find it really nice that things you used to have to navigate around to find, like player civilizations and possibly the map type, could be more readily accessible. Sliding down to the bottom left it's mostly unchanged aside from some new artwork. I'm curious what the addition symbol is for and if there's advanced options hidden there. I also like the small arrow that's hinting you might be able to compress the panel. I'm still waiting for a full blown cinematic mode that removes all of the notifications and UI at the press of a button. It would be a very YouTuber and streamer friendly option to include and just helps us showcase the game's graphics a bit more. Moving on at the castle we can see the Tatar's unique unit is in fact the Keshik, which is the cataphract looking unit with a spear. We don't get a glimpse at its stats or cost but it's probably very subject to balance changes at this point anyway. At the stable though we see there's four types of cavalry units available. There's the light cavalry, knight and camel line plus a lancer cavalry line which we also get a glimpse of in the field. Given that it's in the same spot as the battle elephant for southeast asian civilizations I'm guessing this is specific to the Tatars and maybe a few other civilizations like the Kumans who are also confirmed in the game. It'll be interesting to see if the Mongols now get this unit as well and what exactly its role is. I was really glad to hear this from Adam as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's all of the stuff we're going to show and all the stuff we're going to talk about. The great thing is, is that all of it's toggleable. Um, like the graphics are the graphics. We're not going to like there's not old school mode yeah. where you can bid everything up. But all of the improvements and everything that we've done to the game, because there's been a lot of modernization in the last 20 years in real time strategy games. Um, all of it's optional. So if people are like super old school and they want to play like 1999 AI and like all of the old ways to play the game, keyboard shortcuts, it's all there. I don't know if keyboard shortcuts are necessarily old school, but the point is well taken that there's a big focus on customization, whether that's hotkeys or new quality of life features. That's great to hear since the focus should be on letting everyone decide which of the new features they want to use. Speaking of which, a couple of other new features are also shown off as well. <laughs> at, the, at the top right you can see a global queue, so you can see Anywhere where you are on the map, you can see, okay, my castle is making Keshix, my stables are creating stables. You can quickly, you know, jump around wherever you are, from wherever you are. There's no need to go through everything anymore. If you click on the stable as well, you can see like the little progress bar to see how far along it is, just to help people, you know, get that overview. The global queue is a nice feature. I'm sure they've also implemented the Definitive Edition 1 and Age of Empires 3 feature of queued units and technologies as well. The progress bar above the buildings isn't something I've ever felt a need for, but I'm okay with as long as it's only there when the building is selected. The next reveal has to do with making the game more inclusive for new players, and their plan is to include tutorials on particular skills. We now have a series of challenge missions that teach you everything from like, hey, here's how to get a get a boar back to your your town center without murder, getting it, killing all of your villagers to like, hey, here's how to fast castle, right? Which is a, a medium to high, when you're becoming a better player, it's things that you want to learn to actually really understand Age of Empires. And they're all applicable to actually playing multiplayer and the campaigns. In all honesty, I think this is a great idea. It's an old game that many people have been playing up to 20 years, so it's daunting for someone just starting to figure out all of the things they need to know in order to play competently online. If the devs are including tutorials to speed up the learning curve, I think that'll save a lot of people time. Really, things like boar luring are critical to having even modest success at the game, so it's thoughtful to include that. And speaking of learning to play the game, they also talked about the AI. I know Promi, who I've interviewed before, is involved with making the AI, and in another interview said it's been majorly rewritten. 
Here we have it in Cision's own words. Okay, so we actually put a lot of work and effort in the AI, and the AI is so much better now. If you only played back in 1999, uh, the AI was, first of all, it cheated. Oh. It, wasn't, it wasn't all that good. It cheated. Uh, I knew it! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but ever since AG came out, and now definitely with DE, we improved the AI so much. If you just put one of the new AIs against seven of the old AIs, it just wipes the floor with it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. really yeah. nice yeah. thing yeah. about the AI there is that it now uses tactics that professional players actually oh, use in tournaments. No, stop it. Take it back. I don't it's want it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good thing is you can still put the lower level uh, oh, in there if you want. So you can have yeah. a relaxing game, build your town, Try to be the enemy, that's fine. Okay. One versus seven against hardest old AIs all on the same team would be something to see. Either way, some very strong AIs of course exist, like Barbarian and Promi's own on Vubli, and the prospect of seeing something of that caliber in Definitive Edition is definitely good news. There is going to be a clip here of a battle, but before that they chatted a bit more about some of the new features. So right now we have an automatic farm queue, you just click it, you go out for fighting and your villagers will be like, okay, I have enough resources to keep on farming, I will keep on farming. And you don't have to bother about it ever. I think the thing is, is like there are people who are watching right now who are like, wow, that's that seems like kind of like normal. But then yeah, like, yeah. for those yeah, of like, us who have been playing Age, you're like, oh, thank <laughs> <God."> <laughs> Yeah. Actually, another uh, little improvement that's in every modern RTS game, but not in Age of Empires, is uh, command queues. So basically, yeah. we're now oh, going yeah. to tell these guys, build two stables and then go and get some gold. Wow. Wow. So less babysitting for villagers and more, more action. Yeah, more, yeah. more getting into the play. The automatic farm seating was in Definitive Edition 1, so it was definitely going to be included. But the command queue is new to me and very welcome. There's definitely some micromanagement skills being lost in all of these changes, but in my opinion that puts the focus more on strategies and choices, which is far more rewarding. Yet another new feature that wasn't included in Definitive Edition 1, as far as I know, was also revealed. Alright, I'm going to select my army here. Uh, actually, a little uh, other update. I'm now selecting my army, my picks, my villagers, but the game is now smart enough to see like, oh, you don't want to take your picks to the fight. Oh, that's so. huge! <laughs> That's one of those little things to Same. make it a bit easier. But again, if people want to take their pigs to the fight, they can do that they too. They can still do it. Totally cool. yeah, <laughs> My take on that is that he's saying this is something that could be toggled on and off in options, say as a smart selection option, which is a great thought. I feel like with any feature that's new, you're going to find at least 5% of the player base isn't going to like it. So making everything optional, no matter how much you think people are going to love it, feels like the right move to me. And finally, we can fast forward to the battle. Let's take a look. And while we're fighting, Whoa, we'll... oh, <laughs> so good, so good. All right, I'm gonna attack here. There's a catapult in the back, so I need to get to that as soon as possible. Uh, but one thing that we really try to keep in Age of Empires is the fighting. Everybody just loves the fighting. It's the same good old rock, paper, scissors system. We updated the balance a tiny bit, of course, uh, and we have the new Sith with new uh, abilities, but other than that, it's good old Age of Empires. Oh man. It's, it's quite fun so just watching good. the mess, isn't it? Like, he's like, okay, that guy's dead. Okay, <laughs> no, he's not dead. Okay, great. Uh. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, anyway. Bert, Adam, I, I want to say thank you so much. If you'd like I'm not going to lie, this was a little scary to see, but bear with me for a minute, it might not be as bad as it looks. First, Sijin uses attack move to send his army in. So far, so good. There's a lot of pathfinding that needs to be calculated here, and everything seems pretty smooth. He then regular moves a subset of those units in, which you can see with the red X. Next, he points to the mangonel, but doesn't actually target it. He just selects it to view its health. Maybe a misclick, but in this case, kind of a big one. Those units then go in, followed by the attack move units, including a bunch of camels. They then proceed to mostly sit there, with fewer than half of them doing any fighting. Some of the light cavalry just runs around aimlessly, and most of the camels are just doing nothing. He's also explaining something, so he's not even necessarily seeing this. Adam, though, you can tell is having a mini heart attack as he's looking at this. I don't think it's actually as bad as it looks though, because I'm pretty sure those units were set to no attack stance. You can see earlier in the video that Tamerlane is on defensive stance, and he's getting in on the fighting. He's still firing the arrow before he loads it, which is just a classic manga die sleight of hand. Notice as Sijin is moving his units in several instances though, there's no stance selected, meaning they're set to different things. My guess is all of the camels and lots of the light cavalry here are on no attack stance. In HD on no attack stance, you can see that units with attack move or patrol go right past enemies and stand there in a similar way to what we saw in the demo. 
My guess is that's what happened, and Sijin realizes it right about there. If true, that makes it hard to say a lot about the pathfinding based just on this. Nothing really jumps out at me that's unusually good or bad if we look just at the units that are fighting. It's still not quite enough for me to really pass judgment on pathfinding, though I can't say I've been impressed by anything to do with that yet, and that one light cavalry bugging out has me a bit nervous that there's still some work to be done. I am glad to see though that there's none of these stutter stepping that the HD AI tends to do a lot, and hopefully that's been worked out. So that covers the entire interview, and in terms of my big takeaways, I want to start with what I liked. The user interface seems a lot more friendly to me, and I hope it's customizable in lots of different ways. Adam pointed out a few times how many new things can be turned off if you don't like them, and I think that's a huge positive for me. The fog on the map, for instance, is something I hope can be turned off if you're playing a more serious game. Same thing for the smart selection function and automatic farm reseeding for those that don't want it. Again, the graphics also look great. It's very recognizable as Age of Empires, with the right sort of style, but with a lot more detail and less pixelation. Quite a few commenters in my last video on the trailer breakdown pointed out it's harder to distinguish between units. I do see where that's coming from, but remember these demos are trying to show as many new units as possible. In a real game, you often won't have four or five different types of cavalry in the same army. At this point, I'm not worried about recognizing them in the context of a real game, and it was pretty obvious to me in the teal army which were the light cavalry and which were the cavalry archers. Maybe a unit detail option could address this, and there could be more colorful, lower detailed versions you could switch to if it turns out to be an issue. Another positive is all the work that it sounds like has gone into the AI. When you follow the online community closely, it's easy to forget that the majority of Age of Empires 2 players are actually playing offline just against the AI. Creating a more challenging AI that still has the ability to play at lower levels is a great sign that those people are being remembered. I'm also really happy to see what I think is a very reasonable price for it, and that it's coming to Steam. Right away, both of those things are going to boost adoption by the player base. In terms of negatives though, I do have to say the system requirements are pushing things a bit. Windows 10 is listed as a minimum, which puts the 40% of Windows users still on Windows 7, potentially in a tough spot. I get that it's a Windows game and they want to push their current operating system, but that's a big subset of people that it sounds like might be excluded. When it comes to other negatives about the game, I feel it's too early to pass judgement on a lot of things. Rather than frame things as criticisms, I'll say there are a few things we just don't know enough about yet. For instance, obviously we're still missing confirmation that pathfinding is improved. The lack of an obvious improvement so far isn't ideal. But I think as more people get in on the beta, that information should come out. It's critical they get it right, considering they're competing against two perfectly playable versions of the game already. We also don't have enough info on the multiplayer performance yet. Again, as we all know, this is critical to getting mass adoption. That means not just making it so that a majority of computers can run it, but to also make sure that the lag between computers is low with dedicated servers. An official blog post on Xbox.com mentions a new spectator mode and tournament features, so it seems like multiplayer has some thought going into it, as of course it should. I'm looking forward to hearing more official information on that, and especially if they're able to find a way to eliminate desyncs forever. And finally, I'm surprised we haven't heard anything about modding or scenarios yet. As we've seen in some screenshots, the scenario editor has definitely been expanded with a lot of new units, so it seems like it's on their radar. But part of the reason the game has stuck around so long, and has had so much success on Steam at least, is the workshop. There are a lot of mods, of everything from small trees and grid lines, to complete unit and building reskins, on top of custom campaigns and tutorials that are all easy to find and download. They talked about the importance of community support, so let's hear about all the ways they're going to support the creative side of the community that makes new maps to keep things fresh after everyone's played their 1000 plus hours of Arabia and Black Forest. If anything, it takes a lot of pressure off Forgotten Empires to make new content if they just give the community the tools to do it themselves. After all, that's how Forgotten Empires was started. It was a community driven project. I hope to hear a lot more about the ways they're supporting that in the upcoming weeks and how they plan to improve on the really underwhelming Definitive Edition 1 system of uploading mods to the Age of Empires website with other people having to download them and unzip them into the game scenario folder. Just say we'll still have the Steam Workshop and that it'll transfer those files over to players on the Windows Store and I'll be happy. 
But those are just my thoughts and reaction to the first gameplay we've seen. So far, things are looking to be on the right track, and of course, I'll update you guys as more info comes out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.